Thank you all for having me here today to talk. I am one of the endoscopy trained MIS surgeons, so definitely ERCP is in the armamentarium. And I think that gives a slightly different perspective on some of the approaches to this because different than colleagues who need to call in your GI friends, you know, you can kind of run through a standing algorithm on what you think. You know, my typical approach, very similar to that, and I'm sure we'll get into it in the discussion section, you know, is to try A, then B, then C, then, you know, so having that in the back pocket often helps. It also probably saves time on scheduling for others. What I'm going to talk to you today about, however, though, is the stinker of OD dysfunction world. And I think most of these patients, as compared to the previous video, are usually a delayed diagnosis following a cholecystectomy in patients who have undergone their gastric bypass. And I think that creates a little bit of a different opportunity um, for management. These are my disclosures. Um, again, I am not a bariatric surgeon, but the surgical endoscopy world is kind of my space. So sphincter of OD dysfunction, for those of you who are less familiar with this, is basically the achalasia of the common bile duct. It's an abnormal relaxation of the sphincter at the bottom of the bile duct that results in bile stasis, and that usually leads to an elevation in transaminase function based on lab testing and or dilation of the common bile duct. This is most common in females, particularly those around my age, 20s to 50s, and the incidence is less than 2%, but I think this is often an underreported number because the true diagnosis, the gold standard, is manometry of the sphincter of OD, and that in itself is quite complicated and requires relatively expensive equipment for what is commonly now being empirically treated without proof of original diagnosis. So what I think is important in this is the initial patient population in whom you need to consider this diagnosis. So you're probably all familiar with the Rome 3 criteria, but you've got to hit every single one of these criteria to have the ability to qualify for a diagnosis of sphincter of OD dysfunction. And when you pause for a moment, these are all of your classic gallbladder type symptoms, right? They're the epigastric and right upper quadrant pain, pain that's not relieved by bowel movements, pain that's not relieved by repositioning. Your pain comes and goes on a daily level related to triggering factors, but is not exactly daily. It's not always constant. It gets to the point of disrupting daily life. So again, things you would commonly hear in terms of some of those biliary colic type symptoms. When we look at the Milwaukee classification specifically for sphincter of OD dysfunction, they've broken it down into two categories. They've broken it down into the biliary component and then the pancreatic component. And the long and short of that is there are three types of sphincter of OD dysfunction. Type one is the type that you would expect to have symptomatic improvement with intervention. They're the group who has the classic symptoms of pain. They have classic symptoms of obstruction based on their lab values for liver function tests and or pancreatic tests, depending on which one you're looking at. And they have a dilated bile duct, which would be greater than eight millimeters based on this criteria. Type two is that you've got the classic pain symptomatology on the Rome 3 criteria, but you only have one or the other. So you either have the abnormal LFTs, but not a dilated duct, or you have a dilated duct, but normal liver function tests. Type three, I really honestly struggle with because as maybe those of you who came to the inguinal hernia talk heard Brian Jacobs talk about earlier, they only have pain symptomatology. And pain symptomatology, I think, is a quite tricky area because there are so many other things in the world of just pain. So I prefer personally just to treat the type 2 and the type 1 categories where there is an objective abnormality that is not necessarily perfect, and I'll show you the data to support this as we're going through it, um, but it's a little bit tricky, I think, in that type 3 group. This is the pancreatic version of that exact same thing. So as compared to the dilation of the common bile duct, the dilation of the pancreatic duct is the replacement there. Abnormal liver function test is replaced by abnormal amylase and lipase levels. As was mentioned earlier by Aaron very nicely, um, the anatomic challenges after gastric bypass are what are really the challenge in this patient population for sphincter of OD dysfunction. The standard of care is the manometry, as I mentioned earlier, but again, to get the access point to get there to perform the manometry is quite challenging because then once you're there, if you might be missing a diagnosis, if you had a bad test, if you had a flaw in the performance, you don't really wanna have to come back on that patient for an additional intervention once you've gone through the level of hassle that it is to get to the 
transambulary region in patients post gastric bypass. So as you heard earlier, the per oral ERCP, kind of the double balloon approach going all the way down and then back up your Y anatomy, the transgastric approach for ERCP, which again, if you're post cholecystectomy, I think is a commonly used one now, and then surgical options, the transduodenal sphincterotomy done surgically. In terms of looking at studies, um, none of the study populations that exist out there at this point in time have a large number of patients, and I think that's part of the underreporting piece of this as it plays in. This was a study of 50 patients who needed ERCP after gastric bypass, and again, as it came down to this, 15 of those patients had very obvious common duct stones, things like that, and 35 of them got to the point of not having a structural abnormality to explain the dilation of the ducts and things like that. And again, this is on average four years following their gastric bypass, so again, a very common time where you've led to the stasis on that, you've had a lot of those metabolic changes, you've gone down on the weight, all of the things that Dr. Baker so nicely described. So when we look at this, they were all women. So again, back to the idea of the 20 to 50 year old population. And as we look at those subtypes, the type ones being the ones again that have all of the criteria met, dilated ducts, abnormal LFTs, and pain that is compatible with this, and type two being those that have at least one or the other of those abnormal findings. So they were all able to undergo successful treatment in terms of intervention. However, 40% of them did need recurrent interventions. And I think in this population, that's a very tricky thing um, because at least in the world of ERCP, as I have been trained and understand it, the sphincterotomy, if performed well and adequate, should not be such that it recurs. So that's something that's a little bit different in this paper than what I think are standardly accepted for not post-gastric bypass patients. 9% um, chance, however, for the post-ERCP pancreatitis, which tends to be the most complicated thing as compared to others, which are very smaller chances, such as hemorrhage and things like that. In the symptomatic resolution group, though, you can see that the type 1s and the type 2s did have a moderate improvement in the symptomatology. So the type 2, again, very, very small numbers here, but being the highest symptomatic resolution, and that only being about the 50% mark. So it's not something that this is going to always resolve pain symptomatology because it is a rare diagnosis, but it is something that you would not want to miss. What I thought was interesting, however, is, is that if you don't look at it just against the type 1, type 2, type 3, but you look at it based on the liver function tests and the dilation of the common bile duct, you can see a very nice correlation between people with normal imaging and lab tests versus those with abnormalities. So you do see a correlation of the response there that you're more likely to get a positive result in terms of pain improvement in your patients if they do have documented abnormality to begin with. This is, again, a laparoscopic assisted ERCP. So again, going through the transgastric approach, 22% of these patients had sphincter of OD identified as their cause. Again, this was limited to the type one and the type two group, meaning that if people only had the pain symptomatology, already had their gallbladder out, but didn't have another abnormal finding, they weren't gonna put them through that procedure. Um, OR time, three hours, that is definitely a reasonable length of time based on my performance of this, so it's not quite the straightforward ease of things that you sometimes see. Um, and complication, 16%. Um, one was an intraoperative conversion, lap to open, um, and the other major ones that you see, again, abdominal abscess, that had to do with closure probably of the gastrotomy site um, and poor healing there, and then a dislodged G-tube that required the repeat surgery for replacement. Follow-up was 14 months for this group. So this is their breakdown, and again, they've classified it by the biliary type versus the pancreatic type, and again, looking at specifically the type 1 qualifications, the type 2 qualifications. So what I think is interesting in that is, is that these type 1s, which again are the ones that you would expect to have more improvement, um, are doing relatively well in this paper's outcomes. So in terms of surgical options, I think Dr. Adams did a great paper um, on the surgical approach for transduodenal sphincteroplasty. This could again be done laparoscopic, this could be done robotic, this could be done in open technique depending on the comfort of your surgeons. Um, and this was a group of 16 people with four of them being type one, 
and nine of them being in the type two category. What was interesting in this paper, however, was that it noted that in all 16 cases, ampullary stenosis was confirmed on intraoperative examination. So sphincter of OD dysfunction is typically a functional disease. Again, you would not expect a formal stenosis, so to, be, so to speak, to be present. So it does raise the concern that some of our sphincter of ODs may truly be a formal ampullary stenosis, a scarring process, whether that's from ischemic change, whether that's from de-innervation process, as was all mentioned. Um, for this, this were mostly done in the open approach, five days average hospital stay. Um, and again, two patients did require repeat interventions approximately three years out. Um, and 85% reported pain improvement after surgery. So quite all over the board in terms of those outcomes, anywhere from the 20 to 40% up to the 80 to 100%, depending on what you're looking at. But again, these studies are quite limited on numbers of patients with no more than about 25 people being in that sphincter of OD dysfunction category. So in conclusion, I do think that post-gastric bypass patients who have ongoing abdominal pain are challenging. I do think that sphincter of OD dysfunction definitely has to be considered in that group. But because of the limitation on the diagnosis on not being able to perform standard manometry without starting down the surgical pathway, it's almost more common that they're going to get an empiric treatment, at which time the best thing I think personally is the setting of expectations up front on their chances for improvement of pain based on that classification of type 1, type 2, and type 3 from a coaching perspective on them. And with that, I will save questions for the panel at the end. Thank you.